I'm super excited. <laughs> Today's a big day for us. I'm, I'm Mike Manalo from the Nerds of Color. Um, I'm excited for audiences. I, you know, they haven't seen this yet. They will tonight. It is just phenomenal, honestly. This is oh. really, I, I mean, here's the thing. I've had a long, long history with the Ninja Turtles. I've loved these characters so much. I grew up loving the 80s cartoon show. I grew up loving the 90s live action movies. And honestly, after Secret of the Ooze, you know, no disrespect to anyone else, but there has there haven't been great Ninja Turtles movies to come out since then. You know, I mean, like Ninja Turtles and three wasn't wasn't bad, um, but I wasn't a huge fan of the Bay produced ones. And TMNT was no disrespect, you know, like it wasn't the best it could have been. And then it's Mutant the Mayhem came out. Oh. And I was just like, <laughs> Oh my God! This is it. This is it. This is my favorite Ninja Turtles movie of all time. Oh, that's so. great to hear. It's so <laughs> great. It's really great. Also for the for me, as I collected the comic books. Yeah, so I've got the first first issue issues one through four plus the Raphael my, one issue micro series that I just top loaded them in my nice. in just, just the other day. I mean, they're not in the best shape. The first uh, issue is second printing. I couldn't get the first printing. Dog. <laughs> but uh, I was a huge Frank Miller fan back then so i love the wolverine miniseries he did the electra uh daredevil electra series that he did um and ronin and the dark knight and like at first like that comic book the the, the turtles was a, a send-up it was like a parody of frank miller written in right. his voice right and so to watch it how it mutated literally mutated <laughs> over the years um was super exciting and actually i really enjoyed seeing that and i could never have predicted this this obscure underground comic would be so popular and yeah. everybody on the film that came to it came from a different perspective like i was one of the older people so i came from the original comic uh perspective there were several that came from this the, the saturday morning cartoon the 2d cartoon there was another like the art director arthur fong he had he still had his toys and so he would like like show some like every every meeting he would say well here's this techno drone toy from this other from like here's this other toy and we would have like this moment of show and tell almost where everyone would talk about it. and even in the design it seeped into the design of the movie yeah. like uh there was this idea of using the color which you know a, a, a 2d 80s saturday morning cartoon is kind of garish in its color palette and the toys were too like you have limited number of, of colored plastic you can use and so they generally are pretty bright colored and the chunkiness of the molds and everything affected the design. And I remember uh, the other art director, uh, Tiffany Lamb, talking about it and like really guiding the 3D along the way. And it was like the cut lines or the seams in the geometry, like how that was all influenced by the toys. And so there was like, there was this aspect of it that was really influenced by everything that came before it. And I joke that there was a shot in the movie where I said, we have to do this one 100% Michael Bay. I was like, and that is the, there's a shot where the turtles land on the back of the, of the, of the giant creature. And we do this orbiting shot. It's a, yeah. six, it's a long lens shot. And like, just tons of parallax going. And there's like count, like the rising up in frame. And like, it's, if you know anything about Michael Bay, it's a classic Michael Bay shot, but we felt like we wanted to go hundred percent at that moment in the film. So like, there's like little things, little nods that we did along the way that aren't necessarily things you'll notice, but maybe you'll feel, you know, and that's good. That to me is something that is, that feels right for a film. Like you want to want to take anyone out of the film, yeah. but you want to have an authentic. And one thing that was really important to all the filmmakers was an authentic experience. Like that was something that really was important. It really felt like it really was a Ninja Turtles movie in every definition, as you kind of described, even, you know, one of my favorite scenes, I think, is when Leo is sort of narrating their grocery store mission, and it calls back to the Daredevil-inspired Laird and Eastman comic books, yeah. like the 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 all-white eyes that look like, yeah. uh, yes. you know, Batman and everything like that. And I'm like, this is brilliant. You guys are incorporating everything in Turtles history um, into this movie. And was that a challenge for you? I think it was. It's like a responsibility, right? Yeah. You... It's you, you're walking a line between being too uh, being too uh, uh, fastidious for fans, yeah. and then also trying to create something new and our take on stuff, and making sure that you're staying true to the vision for the film. And from the get go, Jeff Rowe, the director, was adamant 
about it being a teenage experience. And we would talk about like, even in the photography style, how the cinematography, like how do we shoot it? And we really felt like when we're with the teenagers, there's no other adults around in air quotes. It was all about capturing early Spike Jones cinematography. Like this idea when he was starting his career, shooting skate videos and like this idea of hanging out with your friends and like Spike Jones very much has this authenticity about him and this filmmaking style from those early, early work, right? And like he had done this collaboration with Arcade Fire called Scenes from the Suburbs. That was a touchstone for us. And this almost like finding these moments and not mm. knowing who's going to talk when and reacting with the camera to that moment. Like, oh, now it's Leo saying something. Oh, no, no, wait, wait, Raph's saying something. And a little bit of these micro adjust, these handheld micro adjustments to the camera were super important. And in the scene that you're talking about with the white eyes, so we go through, we actually purposely shot that bit like super heroic, as if like, here's the movie that everyone thinks we're going to make. And then the moment he says, Gogurt, we actually cut to the actual turtles and the camera's super handheld and, off, and kind of off kilter. And the turtles are just being who they are. And that, that moment, that transition was like, that's the magic trick for us. Yeah. We said, if we can get the audience to go along with that and find humor and connect, then we've got them. Then we've hooked them at the beginning. It's almost like it's kind of this foreshadowing. Like the beginning is how they're going to be at the end when they when they do they they become the heroes. But then we start yeah. here with them as teenagers, and so we're sort of using those sub the the cinematography is partly a subtext to support all of that. I think to me that was that really to your point is kind of the soul of this movie is the fact that they're teenagers, and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of chatter out there about how you know the movie itself and the style is is really inspired by things like spider-verse mitchell's of course and and uh puss in boots for example was another one that came up yep. i think it goes beyond that and is kind of a little bit more unique it's and and definitively turtles but all of that stems from the teenage part of it because we haven't really had a teenage mutant into turtles movie where the turtles really were teenagers even april o'neill in several yes. of the iterations has been an adult you know yes. um and if the, she's hanging out with teenagers and then the teenagers have a crush on her it's a little like weird you know yeah but everyone here is is age appropriate they're they're teenagers and the art style reflects that like the rough crude sketches and and the the colors and everything like that but it's evocative of who these characters are it's evocative of how they see the world right. and even when they're going and and narrating different things you get into the kind of the crayons style you yeah. know um, of, of their own perspectives and i thought that that was brilliant so um for you guys to kind of piggyback off of spike jones's work and the arcade fires work you know um was a very smart move and something that's never been done in ninja turtles you know history so i i, I applaud you guys for that well, we appre uh, i appreciate that and really that all comes from jeff like when i yeah. first met jeff like i hadn't met him uh until this film and before yeah. the film started before i i was on he was already working on it I asked him in my very first meeting, like, is there a filmmaker that you're trying to, is there something that inspires you? And, and he brings up Spike Jones and like in this obscure kind of short film. And when I watched it, I said, Oh, this is something different. I, I want to be a part of this and just his energy. And I'm sure you've interviewed him. Like he is a generous filmmaker. He has a vision. And like I said, the best idea wins inspires you to bring your best to the table. Yeah. Right. And so now you have a filmmaker who's relentless that makes you – encourages you to be relentless. And so yeah. it all feeds upon itself. And and towards that, the, your note about the look of it, Yashar Kasai asked everyone to bring in their high school art. You know, it's like nice. we were looking at this thing to try to figure out, you know, I, in the beginning of a filmmaking process, even though I'm not in the art department, I get to go to these art reviews. And so I'm just yeah. watching. I'm sort of auditing this art, you know, happening in front of me. And they were, you know, this, the, the meticulous search for what makes a teenage drawing a teenage drawing was super important. And Yashar would talk about how, you know, you, when you were that age, you would be very serious in your drawing style and like holding the pencil too hard or pressing too hard on the paper and what effect that would have. All of these things were all happening early on in the movie. And you can imagine it's very untraditional. And I welcome the comparison to Spider-Verse. I think, you know, the thing that I like to talk about is the Spider-Verse effect. 
that Spider-Verse yeah. allows us to make this film. And is isn't, you know, like they have their own style, but we have our own style as well to our film that is trying to stay true to this teenage drawing thing. Like that's, and that's where, you know, the art really does inspire everybody else. Like you really yeah. get a sense of like how, uh, like seeing the art helped me make my choices and helped me decide how to do, how to direct my, my department to do the camera work. I think that that's actually one of the most brilliant things about this movie. And and you talk about the Spider-Verse effect. To me, this also enhances that effect because one of the biggest effects Spider-Verse has shown us and one of the biggest effects that I think TMNT contributes to is this idea of animation, not just for kids, not just as, as you know, uh, its own separate genre. I think Del Toro definitely spoke about oh, yeah. it a lot. It's a medium. Yes. It's a medium for storytelling. And we're getting to the point where people should start taking animation seriously as real cinema. And I think you, what you guys have done here really contributes to that very well. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, on, on animation really becoming, you know, even taking something as much as people might mock it, a, a concept like Ninja Turtles, but turning it into, my opinion, real cinema. It, I'm going to say it. I don't care what people say. It's real <laughs> cinema to me. You know, uh, turning it into this. Um, I mean, like, what do you think about that and, well, it's a, and it's how a, animation's evolved there? Well, first, it's as, as as hearing it from you, it's a huge compliment. You always strive, whenever you work on anything, you want it to be cinema. I mean, yeah. it's not like you said, I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a great quote-unquote animated film. Like, you want to make a great film. It yeah. happens to be that we're using animation as the medium by which we're telling this story. But, like... We want to use it and, and be artistic and creative as we can in the medium of animation. And the great thing about animation is, is that you make everything. It's also one of the most challenging things about it is nothing's for free. You don't yeah. – every single thing that comes up on screen has to be designed, has to be thought about, and it's painstakingly thought about, designed, built, surfaced, rendered. All of it comes out, you know, uh, uh, you know out of somebody and not just one – you know, hundreds of people's hands. It's, I've worked in live action and I like, I love my time in live action. It was fantastic. One thing I like about animation, it's the most collaborative of the sort of cinematic, you know, story forms to me because it, because it has to be, you know, no yeah. one person can do all the things, right? And there's nothing for free and it forces us all to work with each other and to also be respectful of the other person before us and the person that comes after us. And so I think there's like something that that creates. And in a film like this, where everyone, I, all these people were doing that little bit extra to try to put some more of themselves into the film. I think it shows in what ends up on screen and it's super yeah. inspirational. Uh, I, you know, I, I find that any story can be told in animation. I looked at uh, one film that blew me away of just a, from a few years ago, Flea. A flea is, yeah. a, is an amazing film. I mean, and it had to be in an animated context because it's like this documentary that where he, the, the storyteller is recounting something that happened to them in the past. And that it allows you this form of storytelling that's a little bit more ephemeral in some way. And, yeah. and it's a challenge because unlike in live action, to connect with a character, it's so much more difficult because the artifice of it is right there in your face. Like you don't have another human in front of you. You have this drawn or rendered character that's trying to create emotion like that leap and this is where like a tip of the hat to the animation team Jacques Daigle and everyone at Micros like really embraced the performance side of it to get these characters to feel something to so the audience feels what they're feeling and they're longing to belong and to be accepted which is the underlying story of it all is it's a very universal thing of, of being a teenager feeling different like it's it's yeah. in the DNA of the film and the different approaches of Superfly versus Splinter, and it, it's it's all there. So like, I, I I'm I'm appreciative that you you see it as cinema. Not everyone does, and you're just what, all you can do is keep making things, keep trying to push the medium forward, and 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 really trying to push the boundaries of it as much as you can. I'm telling you though, as as long as you have movies like Mutant Mayhem coming out, then I think the audiences, the critics the academy eventually will start seeing this this medium 
as a, a means to tell real cinematic stories like Mutant Mayhem. And I, I think this is a hugely successful argument for why we should consider um, I, these types I, of stories. I appreciate as, it. You know, even, yeah. even amongst ourselves, we can be skeptical. I remember yeah. when they first announced the Lego movie at that moment, I was like, wow, really? And then yeah. I saw what Phil Lord and Chris Miller made, and I was absolutely blown away. And it's very much a similar case where there's a story that like you could be skeptical of, but then you see what they made and the imagination that went into it, the 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 the, the thinking, the thought process, the humor, like it's all and the craftsmanship, it's all there. And yeah. it's it's I, I think that you can never discount something until you actually see it. And then the proof's in the pudding. I exactly. I was thinking the exact same thing. The proof is is there in the pudding. And you know, when it when it comes down to it, a great story, great characters, they can come from anywhere. Right. You know, and and it, it it's evident here in Mutant Mayhem for sure. One of the things I really wanted to touch on, um, if I may, yeah, yeah, we touched on the teenage part of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'd love to touch on the ninja part because the way that you shot some of these action sequences, brother, oh my god, <laughs> it floored me. It's stuff that I've never seen done in animation, which is literally taking a Jackie Chan movie. The resourcefulness, the speed, the technique, and bringing that to life in every single fight scene and action scene that you you put together here. There's there's brilliant ones that I can call out specifically. I think there's a montage shot yeah. where you're getting the perspective of each of the different characters, but right. they kind of blend together almost right. like one scene, which I thought was brilliantly done. And then there's Splinter scene, which because he's the master, because he's Jackie Chan, you see the Jackie Chan fight in him and i love that and you captured that beautifully was that difficult because i haven't seen that really done in a whole lot of animation yeah sure i'll the, i mean let's first we'll talk about the scrolling you know that was <laughs> what we call the crime fighting montage to no diggity that yeah so the inspiration for that scrolling shot was old boy like oh. that was what we we were we were going for and we first have to start with amazing storyboarding process gabe yeah. lynn and Kyler Spear, co-director Kyler Spear, and the head of story, Gabe Lynn, they were relentless in like their pursuit of excellence, which made it easy for us to do our job. Yeah. So like this is where every department helps each other, you know. So like this wasn't created in a vacuum. This was a team effort. But we went with old boy. And what we thought about was we're doing old boy, but we're gonna do it in a way that would be so hard to shoot re in real live action that people will be blown away. And there's this idea of progression in it. So when it first starts, it's just a series of cuts. They're going to different, you're establishing the environment. Boom, on the beat, boom, boom. And then you're like, okay, I've seen this kind of thing before. But as the as the villains in those each of those environments notices them and stands up and points, we then start the magic trick of, oh, wait a minute. They're doing the same thing at the same time. And then the then we start the scrolling bit and when that happens, if you notice, and this is a tip of the hat to editorial, we start cutting on the beat of the song, which is why the song yeah. is one reason why the song is so important. And we progress. And so it starts cutting faster and faster with each beat. And at the final one with Raph running and tackling all the guys, it cuts in rapid succession between all of them. And it doesn't finish there. We said, okay, so it starts off as individuals, but then we get to this orbiting shot. And like that's like the next level, them working together, but in different environments. And if you this was all done, that sequence was all prevised and shot by the Micros team. And I wow. have to call out one specific uh, artist on there is Rafael Vinicius. He took it upon himself not only to research moves from the historical Turtles movies, but also work with animation so that we were choreographing things they wanted to do. So that requires a lot of work because we have to kind of animate the way the animators are going to. It means we have to take notes from them. And then yeah. if you watch that orbiting shot, it ends with two turtles smashing a, a, a villain between them, which is directly taken from the live action movies. So there's a lot of things happening there that are calling back to, you know, working together. It's old boy on steroids or old boy in animated fashion. It's great storyboarding. And then when we get to the splinter fight, I was telling uh, I was telling David about this. So the splinter fight, we actually did a whole pass on it, and we're we're supposed to be done. And that's when both Jeff and Seth Rogen like this isn't good enough. This isn't this isn't Jackie Chan enough. So then Gabe goes back, and we're trying to get this right. And he boards this amazing bit with the uh, 
uh, you know, with the, all the weapons. And we had a, a, just a few days, but we had a crack team led by Monty Granito and Kyle Robinson sort of putting this thing together. And then we plus those just a little bit more to end up with what we did. And then it was a total surprise to me when editor Greg Levitin, if you noticed, he uses the score from the training sequence on yeah. top of that bit. And it harkens back to the, that, that part of the movie. And so it all comes full circle. So that oh, all those micro choices create the sequence that you liked so much, you know? It's so brilliant, Kent. Honestly, I think it's it's really the magic of filmmaking, the magic of making movies, bringing this to life. You guys really just knocked it out of the park. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> this is so brilliant. This was honestly one of the most fun conversations I've ever had, I think, at the Nerds of Color. Oh, well, and I, I appreciate thank that. You so much no, for it's that. it's it's totally my pleasure. I mean, I loved work. I actually loved working on the film. It was like working for Jeff was and Seth was super inspirational to me. The art department, I'll, and here's the thing: like working with young, inspired people as someone who's older, you know, more or yeah. more experienced was fantastic. Like they just brought so much energy and enthusiasm that it inspired me to be even more enthusiastic on my part. And it just was, I think, infectious for everyone that worked on the movie. Well, all of those people have made this Turtle fan proud, and they're going to make millions of Turtle fans proud after today and through the weekend. Kent, thank you so much for your time. Wow. This was wonderful. Have a great one. All right, you too. Boys, professional artists and professors. Maybe a nerd who's just like you, talking about the things that you like too. So I invite you to the NOC. Yeah.